This is Victor. He was the admitting medical resident for the day. Victor received this phone call from the ED physician. Hey, uh, this is Dr. C from the ED. I got an admission for you. Um, I have a 45 year old gentleman who came in into the ED with severe abdominal pain. And uh, his workup is consistent basically with acute pancreatitis and I think it's alcohol induced. Uh, I gave him 2 mg of IV loaded and 1 liter of lactate drinker and it seems he is feeling better now. What's his name? His name is Appleseed and he's in room 2 in the ED. Okay, let me just finish my lunch and I'll see him after that. Okay, thank you. Victor now is eating his lunch. 30 minutes later, he received this phone call, but this time from an ED nurse. Hey, this is G from the ED. I'm the nurse taking care of Mr. Appleseed. Uh, are you taking care of him now? Yes, uh, the ED physician talked to me about him, but I haven't seen him yet. What do you need? I just want to let you know that his blood pressure is dropping. It's currently 80 over 55. I told Dr. C here in the ED and he told me to start the patient on Levofid and to call you. Is, is he getting any fluids now? Yes, he's getting the second liter now of lactate stringer. Okay, I'm coming to see him. Victor went to grab a cup of coffee before going to the ED. While preparing his coffee, this happened. Code blue, ED room 4. Code blue, ED room 4. Code Blue, ED room 4. Code Blue was called for the same patient Victor was notified about from the ED department earlier. So what went wrong here? Was there a mistake from Victor? What could have been done differently that could have changed what happened to this patient? I will tell you very soon. In today's video, we are going to talk about this phone call we received from the ED physician informing us about an admission. I will teach you how to get the most of this phone call to make it short, quick and to the point. So if you are someone who is doing or will be doing hospital admissions, you will love this video. Keep watching. It is very important to ask the right questions and get the right information from the ED physician when they notify us about an admission. A phone call with adequate information should help us with the following. Decide if the patient should be admitted or not. Disagreement with ED physician on this matter is not uncommon. Decide how soon we should see the patient, immediately or can wait. Build an initial impression on what's going on with the patient. Keep in mind that we should never take any ER story or diagnosis for granted. Remember that. Decide to which unit or floor the patient should go or be assigned to. Give appropriate interim orders if we will not be able to see the patient within the next 30 to 60 minutes from the notification time. First, make sure to get organized. This is very important, especially during busy shifts. So at the beginning of each shift, grab a sheet of paper, which we're going to call the admission sheet. Every time we get notified about an admission or a transfer, write the name of the patient, the location of the patient, time of notification, and your, and your presumptive diagnosis or impression. Please make sure to cross the patient name off once the admission is taken care of. That way, we make sure things remain well organized and no patient gets lost. Again, this is very important, especially in very busy shifts. Now, any phone call we receive from the ED to notify us about an admission can be divided into six parts. First, patient identifying information part, relevant history part, relevant physical exam part, relevant workup part, treatment provided in the ED part, and our recommendation part. Relevant here simply means relevant to the chief complaint of the patient being admitted. Let's not panic here. This phone call should not take more than two to three minutes at the most. Let's start with the first part, patient identifying information. Here we simply mean the patient's name and one or more of the following. Date of birth, medical record number or sometimes the visit number if applicable. This is to make sure not to get confused with any other patient and to easily find the patient in the electronic medical records. I always get the patient's name and either the medical record number or the visit number as searching with numbers is much easier. Don't forget to ask about the patient current location in the ED as well. Now, this part we either get it at the beginning of the phone call or sometimes at the end of the phone call as some ED physicians start with the history part right away. 
I prefer to get it at the end of the phone call so I can immediately write it down on the admission sheet. Let's move to the second part of the phone call, the history part. As we just said, this can become the first part of the phone call. This part must start with the patient age, gender, and chief complaint, then any relevant history related to the chief complaint. Now, in reality, don't expect to get a detailed history. Most of the time, we will have two or three sentences about the chief complaint. So don't be surprised if there was a missing important piece of history. In such case, just kindly ask them about that missing piece of history. If no satisfying answer or no answer at all, just ask these questions directly to the patients when you interview them. This means that sometimes we need to wait until we talk to the patients and examine them to decide if the patient should be admitted or not. The third part of the phone call is the physical exam part. Here we are talking about a focused physical exam relevant to the chief complaint. Again, don't expect much here from the ED physician. Actually, sometimes this part is completely ignored or overlooked. I always make sure to ask them about that. The bare minimum is to get the most recent vital signs and any important physical signs relevant to the chief complaint. For example, someone with stroke-like symptoms, at the very least, I should get vital signs and their neurological exam. This part is very important in deciding how stable the patient is and the level of care needed. Please remember that very well. Let's move to the fourth part, what kind of workup has been done in the ED? This is relevant to the chief complaint. For example, someone with chest pain, I need to know about their EKG and chest X-ray findings, were the troponins positive or not. If there is any missing important diagnostic test, I kindly ask them to perform it in the ED and call me back with the results. Let's say the patient with chest pain, I felt a P is a possibility I can ask them kindly to perform a D-dimer or CT of the chest, whichever more appropriate. The fifth part of the phone call is to know what kind of treatment offered in the ED and what was the patient response to that. Let's say a patient was hypotensive upon arrival to the ED. We need to know how they treated it and how did the patient respond to that treatment. Or a patient with chest pain that was given sublingual nitroglycerin I need to know that and how the patient responded to that treatment. Let's move to the sixth and last part of our phone call. Here we conclude the phone call with our own recommendations if there is any. Let's say I feel the patient should be starting on anticoagulation or given some specific IV antibiotic or fluids or need to be seen by surgery first. We can kindly tell them that. Or we may say the patient should be transferred to another facility or we can say the patient does not need to be admitted and can be treated outpatient, all sorts of things. Now, as I said, this phone call should not take more than two to three minutes at the most. Again, don't forget to immediately write the patient information down on the admission sheet along with the time of notification. Just to let you know, as a side note, this time gets tracked pretty closely to make sure no delays in getting these patients admitted and moved out of the ED. For that reason, we should get the admission done as soon as possible. If we are busy and cannot get to the admission within the next 30 to 60 minutes of being notified, then we should use what we call interim orders. So what are these interim orders? These are quick transitional orders that we put them before seeing the patient based on the information we got from our phone calls with the ED physician. In order to move the patient out of the ED as soon as possible. This way it is not our problem how long the patient will stay in the ED after that. It becomes a big availability issue, not our issue. These orders should include the following. Admission status, observation versus inpatient. This applies to US healthcare system and we'll discuss this in a separate future video. Admission diagnosis, to which unit the patient should be admitted, any important nursing orders, like if we want to order vital signs check more frequently, or if we want to order neuro checks uh, to place a folly, uh, to place the patient pulse oximetry, fall precaution, seizure precaution, etc. We'll discuss this in more details in this video series as well. Diet orders, very important to specify if the patient should remain in PO or not. And if not, please specify what kind of diet. Please don't leave the patient in PO for no good reason. 
We will discuss various diet orders also in this video series, but the most commonly ordered diets are regular, diabetic, cardiac, and low sodium diets. Any important diagnostic tests like serial troponins, repeat EKGs, and ABG, anything that we feel is really important, we should put it in these interim orders. Any important therapeutics like ordering IV antibiotics for pneumonia or ordering pain medications, ordering IV fluid, etc. Now let me give you a quick demonstration of these interim orders. Nowadays, we have electronic order entry. All you need is just a few clicks. Now, these interim orders should be reviewed and adjusted if needed when we see the patients. At that point, full admission orders should be entered. Now, back to the acute pancreatitis patient. The patient became unresponsive and went into PEA while in the ED. He was successfully resuscitated, intubated, moved to ICU, but he was profoundly hypotensive on multiple vasopressors. He succumbed, unfortunately, to his disease three days later. He could have a better chance if was aggressively resuscitated with IV fluid right from the get-go. Victor could have done much more to this patient and possibly saved his life, but instead he did the following. First, he failed to ask the right questions and did not recognize the patient was unstable. Second, he failed to go and see the patient immediately when the nurse told him about the worsening abdominal pain and dropping blood pressure. The patient was clearly unstable. Unstable patient needs to be evaluated immediately without any delay. Now let me show you how Victor should have responded to the phone call and extracted all the pertinent information from the ED physician, the information that will make him know, will, will make him aware that this patient is unstable from the beginning and he should have just gone and see, seen the patient right away. Hey, this is Dr. C from the ED. I got an admission for you. I have a 45 year old gentleman who came in into the ED with severe abdominal pain. And his workup uh, is consistent basically with acute pancreatitis. I think it's alcohol induced. I gave him two milligrams of IV diluted and a liter of lactate ringer. And it seems he's feeling better now. How was his abdominal exam? It's uh, pretty tender uh, with voluntary guarding, but uh, no distension or rebound tenderness at this point. Can you tell me what was his vital signs when he came in and now? Sure. When he came in, his vital signs were, uh, I think, blood pressure 140 over 85, heart rate 120, respiratory 22, temperature 98. To set 98% on room air, and his most recent vital signs. Let me check here. Um, yes, blood pressure 110 over 65, heart rate 130, respiratory 28, temperature 98, and his O2 set still 98%. Uh, O2 set 98% on room air, or what? I believe he is. Let me check. I think he's currently on 3 liters of oxygen, vein nasal cannula. Have you done an abdominal CT or not yet? Yes, let me pull the report here. It showed severe inflammatory process around the pancreas suggestive of acute pancreatitis. Anything mentioned about his gallbladder? No, gallbladder looks okay on CT. How about his labs? Uh, his labs, let me pull them here. His white blood cell count is 20,000. His HNH 16 and 46. Platelets 390,000. Uh, 390, sorry. Um, CMP, sodium 145, potassium 4.5, bicarb 18, chloride 100, BUN 35, and creatinine 1.6, and um, his liver enzymes ALT 100, AST 250, ALP and bilirubin basically normal. Was his chest x-ray okay? Oh, I haven't done one yet. Can you please get one as soon as possible? You said he's requiring oxygen now, right? I'll order it right now. How did he respond to the lauded? Uh, he felt better 
sore initially, but it seems his pain is coming back. How much fluid you give him so far? You said one liter of lactated drink or anything else? I gave him one liter fluid bolus and currently he's on LR 100 cc an hour. Hmm, this guy seems very sick to me and likely will need to go to ICU. Can you please give him a couple more liters of lactated drinker right now? Just give it wide open and I'm coming to see him right now. Sure, thanks. Can I get his name and medical record number, please? Uh, yes, his name is Apple Seed and his MRN is 12345. And uh, where is he now? He's in room 2 in the ED. Thank you, I'm coming right now to see him. In the next video of this admission video series, we'll talk about what to do before, during, and after seeing a patient in the ED. Also, we'll talk about the full admission orders and how they are different from interim orders. At the end of this video, if you found it useful, make sure to share it with your colleagues. Don't forget to tap that subscribe button and notification bell so you can see our videos as soon as they are released. Thanks for watching.